I love plaid. It's classic, geometric, and it works for all seasons and occasions. Today, I'm trying out nine different ways to get the look in your card making, from some DIY options to the latest tools. And here's a spoiler alert. Some are more successful than others. I'm going to start easy and work my way out, but first, I'm actually going to plan ahead a little bit here and create some colored cardstock for a technique I'll show you a bit later. I like to use my Catherine Pooler inks to create my colored cardstock, and I like to do it on this pad of recycled newsprint. It absorbs the little bits of extra ink around the edges, so I don't need to worry about picking it up on my hands or on other pieces of cardstock. To add some interest, I spritz water droplets over top before lifting that color with a paper towel. And finally, added some gold splatter with my Altenew metallic watercolors. I keep a filled up aqua brush right there in the box with them, so I'm not having to find a brush and water whenever I want to do this. Plaid number one. Just grab your favorite coloring medium and make it yourself. Easy, right? I've got some Copics here in reds and greens, and I put them in order along the side here with their caps off. Then I can just draw stripes from top to bottom. You can use a ruler if you want your lines to be perfectly straight. And I did get out a pad of grid paper to help me visually see it. But I like the kind of hand-drawn look I get just by moving my whole arm from top to bottom. You can add interest by spacing the lines differently or doubling up on one color. And when I get to the right side, I often turn the cardstock so I can still hold on to it while I draw that final line. Then I trim the panel horizontal and I do the same thing. You can do this with watercolors, any type of markers, ink cubes, or even the edges of your large ink pads. You can make your stripes broader or narrower, and you can have as many or as few colors as you want. To add more variety, I then use the narrower nib on the other end of my markers to add some thinner lines, both vertical and horizontal. You can also do a tone-on-tone -tone plaid. Here's a rock and red panel and a dark red marker. Same thing with the thicker and thinner stripes, but this time, just one color. Since I've got so many cards today, I'm going to focus on the plaid techniques rather than showing you how I finish the cards but I will list the supplies I used, and as always, there's links below in the video description. If you have any specific questions, just leave me a comment and I'll get back to you. This is just a stacked up Waffle Flower Joy sentiment with the two Copic plaids. Plaid number two is more of an experiment. I don't have a plaid embossing folder, but I do have this old striped one, and I wondered if I could create plaid with it on this white circle die cut. I got a good striped impression, and now comes the test. I turned the circle 90 degrees and I ran it through again. And as I kind of predicted, the second impression sort of flattened out the first one. It is there. I'm not sure if you can see it. And it does add some additional subtle texture, but it's definitely not what I would call successful plaid. I used more of that Copic plaid to finish this card with an older Pretty Pink Posh Joy sentiment. If you're going to use plaid with die cuts, you want them to be pretty chunky so you can see the pattern. Plaid number three is masking and ink blending. I used the grid on my glass mat to help me keep my tape lines parallel. You could use different widths of tape. I've got one inch post-it tape here, and I can make it thicker by taping over top of one that's already here. I tried to vary the widths of the exposed parts of my panel before blending my first color all over it. Another good tip that I only realized at this point would be to cut your tape long enough for the vertical lines so you can reuse it when you do the same color going the opposite way. I continued on with my other colors in the same way, and I did end up deciding to leave some white space as well by making sure that some of the lines were never unmasked by the tape. Again, you could choose any colors you want here, or even just one or two colors for a different look. But using primary colors is always going to give you a rainbow where they mix, which is fun. This one's got a simple lawn fawn die cut in navy blue, and to jazz it up a little bit, I added a white layer just to the birthday word, along with some nouveau crystal glaze and chunky glitter. Plaid number four is to use a striped stencil like this one from Birch Press Design. This one's retired, but there's a lot of striped stencils available. And all you have to do is blend your ink through one way and then turn the stencil and blend it the other way. Now, because all the stripes are the same size, you could really call this one gingham, but I think gingham is just a specific type of plaid, usually a single color, so that's another change. You could also tape over some of the stripes to create that more uneven look. This is really just a faster and easier way than trying to create the plaid just with the tape. These pastel colors were calling out for an Easter card, and I used a Waffle Flower Happy Die, a Scrapbook.com Easter stamp, and an Impression Obsession Bunny. 
Plaid number five is a layering stencil set that's actually designed to create a plaid pattern. I love this set from Pink Fresh Studio because there are three different stencils and all you have to do is blend your ink in and then flip the stencil to get the lines going the other way. Then you layer it up with the other stencils and you get a totally filled in panel. I decided just to use one layer today and leave lots of white space for a more airy feel. And I decided to blend my stripes so that they are just one color. And I think it turned out just so pretty. Plaid number six is gonna build on this one by adding the matching stamp. I've never used it before. And honestly, with how pretty the stencil plaid is on its own, I was really kind of wondering if I needed it, but wait. Well, actually first I had to line it up. I do think in the future I'll stamp before I stencil so that it's easier to line up since you can kind of see through the stencils where the stamp lines would be. I use some acetate in the image on the back of the cling stamp and check out how it changes the look. I think this is super cool and I'm definitely glad I have the stamp. I play up those black accents with my new Mama Elephant Thank You stamp set as well as a negative frame cut with my Essential Squares dies. Plaid number seven is a Concord and Ninth turnabout stamp and a demonstration of my absent-mindedness. I couldn't find my jig that helps make sure I line up the turnabout stamps properly. And I thought, no problem. I'll just use a six inch square piece of cardstock. And I got a hot mess. Then I realized, oh wait, the stamp is about five and a half inches. So I'll do it again with a five and a half inch square piece of cardstock. It's better, but still not perfect. You've probably realized what came to me only hours later. You need to line up the center of the stamp with the center of the cardstock by marking the center of the cardstock. I've used my jig for so long that I completely forgot the basics of that. So please learn from my mistakes. I finished this card with one of my favorite hello stamps. This one's from Catherine Puller and it's likely retired, but it pairs so well with this sunshine word from Waffle Flower. I added interest to my circle with the essential circles for stitching die from Ellen Hudson and a yellow layer behind. Number eight is a plaid background stamp from Catherine Pooler, also retired and a favorite of mine since it's a classic buffalo plaid. I went with classic buffalo plaid colors and I stamped it in black onto my red panel. This is probably the easiest one as long as you only want one color on your plaid design. I love the crisp details on the little diagonal lines between the solid black squares. I finished this one by cutting out the Tim Holtz sentiment from the panel. Using the negative space is a great way to make sure that the letters are lined up and I've got the little red and black letters in a pouch to use on a future card. I added some gold stars for a festive shine. Plaid number nine is another experiment using my gel press and another stamp. I started by putting a thin layer of lime shimmer paint on my gel plate and then I grabbed this pinstripe stamp from Simon Hurley. It's a pull apart, which gives you a lot of flexibility. And my plan is to create my plaid with two colors by removing the paint with the stamp like this. I think that's really pretty and it does give a lot of texture. Next, I did the same thing with my blue paint, but this time I made the lines go the other way on the gel plate. Now it looks like I'm removing quite a bit of paint here. So I was pretty hopeful for the results, but I think because the paint is quite opaque, when I pulled it, I had a mostly blue stripey panel. It's very pretty, so I did finish the card, but I think using more translucent paint or even ink pads would give a better plaid result. And to clean the stamp, I used a microfiber cloth while the paint was still wet and it came right off. You might have a harder time if you let it dry on the stamp. This one has an inlaid Thinking of You die cut from Simon Says Stamp. Inlaying words like this is another way of being sure that they're lined up exactly the way they were intended by the designer. Finally, here's my red panels from the very beginning. And for plaid number 10, I'm using a couple of cover plate dies from Catherine Puller Designs. They're not plaids exactly, but they do have these two different diamond patterns that can build something that looks like plaid. You can put the diamonds behind the lattice for a kind of argyle look, or you can put them on top for another look and space for sentiments or other shapes if you want. You can use different colors. This is kind of pretty, again, with a different look depending on which layer is on top. Finally, you can use two of the lattice pattern and offset them to create what I think probably looks most like a plaid. Because of the offset, you won't get a full four to quarter inch panel from this, but you can get a nice chunk to use as a background. I added it to a craft panel and then put a Hero Arts Merry Christmas die cut over top in white, along with a Catherine Puller snowflake. I think this is a wonderful classic Christmas color combination. 
Are you mad for a plaid like I am? Or do you have another go-to background technique? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time.